Good evening and welcome to virtual public observatory night from the Center for Astrophysics, Harvard and Smithsonian. My name is Sarah Hogan and I'm the donor relations and events manager at the CFA and your host for this evening. While we would rather be with you all in person tonight, we're grateful for the opportunity to present tonight's topic in a webinar format. All audience members have their video turned off and their microphones muted. If you'd like to ask a question during the presentation, please type it into the Q&A section at the bottom right hand of your screen. I will read as many questions as time will allow at the end of the talk. If you're interested in receiving our e-newsletter and information about upcoming events, please make sure to sign up for our mailing list by clicking on the link in the chat section. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Evan Tingle, who is a data analyst for the Chandra X-ray Observatory and will be introducing tonight's speakers. Hi, everyone. I am thrilled to introduce tonight's presenters, Jim Adaviani and Maris Wicks, here to tell you about their new book, Astronauts, Women on the Final Frontier. Jim, a former nuclear engineer and current university librarian, has written award-winning New York Times best-selling graphic novels about history's great scientists who have shaped our world far beyond what you might read in a textbook. This includes Niels Bohr, Rosalind Franklin, Alan Turing, Stephen Hawking, Marie Curie, Richard Feynman, and many others. Jim's writing is fun to read and his enthusiasm and excitement for subjects leaps off the page. You'll find yourself trying to slow down and savor the story or tearing through it in a day. Also, coming away with a cursory understanding of quantum electrodynamics or why tortillas are a perfect zero-G food is a plus. Maris has written, drawn, and colored comics for First Second Books, New England Aquarium, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, SpongeBob Comics, Marvel Comics, and DC Comics. She worked as a program educator for the New England Aquarium, where, side note, she got to throw out the first pitch at a minor league baseball game dressed as a bonnet head shark. Maris spent several months in Antarctica on an artist in residency program funded by the National Science Foundation, documenting the wildlife, the science, and the people, and the otherworldly landscape. Her art is expressive and colorful and able to tell a nuanced story all on its own. And Maris is probably the most tireless and enthusiastic science communicator I know, so you are all in for a treat today. In 2013, Jim and Maris published Primates, The Fearless Science of Jane Goodall, Diane Fossey, and Barute Galdikas, an exciting depiction of the three great primatologists. For their second collaboration, they have created a new graphic novel, Astronauts, Women on the Final Frontier, a book that follows some of the lesser known heroes of the US and Soviet space programs. Jim has worked with many artists over his career, but wrote Astronauts specifically with Maris's art in mind. Together, they use the comics medium to show the trials of women in the space program and place the reader in the shuttle cockpit. Without further ado, Jim Adaviani and Maris Wicks. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, yeah, also, thanks, Evan. And thank you so much to the Center for Astrophysics at Harvard and Smithsonian. Um, it's a pleasure to be here virtually. Um, so Jim and I are going to go through a visual presentation. We have a slideshow and then there'll be Q&A afterwards. I'm going to share my screen and uh, pretty soon you're going to get to see some cartoon versions of us and we'll, we'll take it away. So yeah, that's, that's, that's the book. Woo. Woo. So hi, I'm Jim. I write comics about science and I cosplay myself. And uh, hi, I'm Maris, and I uh, illustrate and sometimes write comics about science. And I am, I am wearing a giant blue flight suit um, for this presentation, but you can only see the top half. Uh, these are some of the books that we've worked on. You may recognize some of them. We collaborated before, as Evan mentioned, on a book called Primates, The Fearless Science of Jane Goodall, Diane Fossey, and Verity Galdikas. And it was an absolute pleasure to collaborate with Jim. Uh, so I don't know, they... Yeah, they let us do it again uh, with astronauts, women on the final frontier. Uh, but we've been saying how we're both science communicators and science comics folks. So what does that have to do with astronauts, you might ask? Well, 
almost all of them are scientists. And the ones who aren't are usually doctors or engineers, which is close enough for us anyway. So what does a famous doctor slash engineer slash scientist look like? This is what a famous astronaut looks like. Gloves, no mix in silicone. Helmet. Polycarbonate, polycarbonate faceplate, mechanical seal, sunshade. Communication, AKA Snoopy cap. Survival backpack, parachute, life raft, survival gear, 30 minute supply of oxygen. Paratrooper boots. Launch and entry pressure suit or LES for short. There's, there's a lot of acronyms. Long johns, cotton. Astronaut, famous. Well, maybe not so famous. I gotta say, Maris and I have had the great good fortune and pleasure to walk around her hometown and through Washington DC with Mary Cleave. That's the astronaut. And nobody ever asked for her autograph. So, why do you think we chose Mary to be the narrator of the story? And another question, why comics? We'll talk more about it soon, but one reason for the comics thing is that comics are for everyone. Stories about imaginary people and real people. People who are famous and people who may never have a TV show or a movie made about them. Comics are really personal. And they allow you to know people by their thoughts, their words, their actions, sometimes all at once in a single panel. So to fully answer the question, why comics? I think we need to first answer the question. Oops, sorry, I forgot that slide. <laughs> I did, I'm sorry. How do comics work? I knew there was another one in there and work its way out. So um, comics are just words and pictures, right? Sometimes not even words. So <clears throat> we're going to switch it up and I'm going to talk about the words part of comics and then Jim's going to talk about the pictures part because we figured it'd be fun to, you know, talk about each other's specialties. <laughs> so words. In this panel that we showed you just a little while ago, we've got a word balloon up at the top and we've got a label down here at the bottom and they have two different text treatments. They two, do two very different things, but you can throw these two chunks of words together in comics to give you different parts of information what a character is saying, and a little bit about that character. In this panel, we've got Teres uh, Valentina Tereshkova coming home and talking to her mom. And the caption box up here is blue. And that's kind of like caption or narrator box. So that's our narrator speaking. And throughout the book, you'll know that that's the narrator talking when you see that blue box. But we've also got a different font treatment for the word balloons. Uh, Jim and I wanted a way to show you that these characters were speaking Russian without writing in the Russian Cyrillic alphabet. Um, so we thought a font, font treatment actually developed by Kevin Cannon, who Jim had collaborated with before on a book called T-Minus that will come up later, um, had d designed this amazing font. Um, so this was a stylistic way that we wanted to show you that different language was being spoken, but you could read this language if you're reading the book in its published language. Um, I think this book exists in, does it exist in other languages other than English yet? Uh, well, I know it's been sold <laughs> yeah. to other language publishers, but I That's, don't, I haven't seen it, uh, another one not, yet, have you? Not, no, not yet, but I, okay. it's something to take into consideration, uh, not just right. from an art standpoint, but thinking about when books get translated. Um, thought balloons. Comics, like I said, can allow you to know a character by the thoughts. And this is Valentina Tereshkova uh, orbiting Earth. And we're getting just her inner monologue here. Um, I like thought balloons because they can be very intimate. You can kind of like, I don't know, it's like looking into a little bit of that character. Um, so I think, I think they're a really nice thing that you can do in comics. This is okay, maybe my favorite part about words, sound effects. Brown. Phew, 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 phew. Creak. Um, 
we can show you what something sounds like in comics. And I, in this panel, Jim and I wanted to show you how loud it was to be standing next to the vehicle that was going to take you into space, um, the space shuttle. So words can, like onomatopoeia, can do a lot of interesting stuff where you can see sound. And then you can throw all that together, where you've got narration and word balloons and sound effects all working together in one panel, giving you all this information. And it doesn't look weird at all because this is the language of comics. You can do a lot in just a little amount of space. And that's one of my favorite, favorite parts of using, the, uh, using comics to tell stories. Oh, and sometimes words are just what you need to get the point across. Um, this was a part in the story where uh, some characters really wanted something to happen and they got denied. So using just that word is the best way to get that point across. Oh yeah, so it's comics and you're really here for the pictures, right? You wanna see what Miras drew. So let's go ahead and look at those. Um, and we'll go back to the thought balloons that Maris was talking about earlier. Uh, but you don't have to put words in places where you would expect them every time. Uh, scientists and engineers often think in pictures. I bet you, you do this as well, at least sometimes. And in comics, we can represent that directly. Uh, and here we're showing how Mary's main objective for applying to the astronaut corps wasn't really about getting into space. She wanted to get in, get behind the pilot seat of very, very fast airplanes. Spoiler, it worked out well for her. Um, you, don't always need, you don't even always need words though. Oh, excuse me, I forgot this. <laughs> yeah, we're, for, we're forgetting that there, there are other examples. I'm sorry. <laughs> in this case, we're not using thoughts, but instead of having Mary explain shuttle thrust physics to someone, we're showing that she understands it and can explain it to somebody else. We don't actually expect you to like pour over this graph and figure out what's exactly going on. It's there mostly to indicate to you, the reader, that Mary knows what she's talking about. And again, that she's speaking in the language of engineering. And, and I drew it and I don't even understand what it means. So, I mean, <laughs> I researched it a little bit, but like. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you don't always have to use words. Uh, the pictures really do tell the story in comics and that's what we want them to do. And it's quite possible, I don't remember, uh, but it's quite possible that I wrote some dialogue for these panels. But if I did, we got rid of it because the pictures Maris drew tell the story of disappointment that this young girl is feeling all by themselves. No words necessary. But we want words there sometimes. Um, and we want them sometimes to contradict the pictures that you're seeing. And here's a little secret. Even astronauts don't always tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth sometimes. And here we show Valentina Tereshkova not telling ground control what's really going on. It's pretty obvious that she is not feeling excellent here on her first flight becomes even more obvious a few panels later. Yeah. <laughs> but I didn't put that in. Thanks. Uh, you can go the other way too. Rather than having the words contradict the pictures, you can have them reinforce them to drive a point home by having picture after picture after picture after picture after picture. Oh wait, right. She's blindfolded for this one, right? Yep, blindfolded. After picture, reinforced by the words that you're seeing. Like this, where we show Mary working out over and over what she'll do in space using the cannon arm. So why hammer at home like this? Well, because we wanted you to really feel what it's like to be an astronaut who has to practice stuff over and over and over again. 
And through all these examples, you've seen color do some of the storytelling as well, right? And color is a really important tool that we use to tell stories, sometimes to show emotion or alarm, like those red and orange panels you just saw, or maybe to show that we're looking back in time, like we're doing here, where the past is in old photos in black and white. And of course, we have one last tool, and that's exaggeration. The drawings in comics can be serious or funny, or they can be both, uh, but either way, we can bend reality a little bit while representing reality as well. But I want everybody to relax, and just so we're clear, even though Astronauts is a, tr is a true story, and we'll talk about doing research in a second, uh, Maris did not actually sit on any babies to make sure she drew this right. Did you? No actual babies were sat upon, or twirled for that matter. Okay. Just clean. <laughs> right, good. So no baby problems. Um, oh yeah, one more thing. And there were no non-human pri human primates on Mary's first shuttle mission either. But again, a tiny spoiler, you might see a few more anyway when you read the book. So those are your basic tools, words and pictures. Simple, right? So now the challenge is to use them well. So what does making the book look like? And now I'm gonna talk about the stuff I do and Maris will talk about the stuff she does uh, just to keep things more clear. So it starts with an idea. And actually the idea for this book popped up in the middle of writing another book. More than 10 years ago, I did a graphic novel about the space race of the 1960s when the US and the Soviet Union were racing to get to the moon first. And in the course of doing that research, I came across the story of 13 women pilots who took and passed the very rigorous physical tests they gave all astronaut candidates. But I only had like 140 pages to go from like 1890 to 1969, so I couldn't fit it in. But I know a good story when I stumble over it, so I didn't throw it away. I just set it aside, knowing I would come back to it later. And I did. But you can't have 13 main characters for a book. That's really too confusing. And hey, they're only the very beginning of the story we wanted to tell anyway. And I also didn't really want to get around the problem of having too many characters by smushing a bunch of different people's experiences together and pretending like everything interesting happened to just one composited Frankenstein, it's October, right? Frankenstein made up person. I mean, sure, we imagine some things, especially dialogue, but I wanted to tell a true story, not something that's just based on one. So when I came back to that idea of women getting to space, I needed to find a main character and decided that it should be someone that wasn't famous. Now, Sally Ride's story is great, as is Valentina Tereshkova's, but it's even more fun to learn about someone new and make the famous people supporting characters. Because frankly, that's kind of how real life is for most of us, right? Most of us aren't famous after all, and neither is Mary Cleave. So how did we get to Mary? So the great thing about NASA is they document everything. So I got to spend weeks reading oral histories of women astronauts looking for someone who both saw history and took part in it. And hey, if they sounded like a cool person to, to hang out with, that's a bonus. And that's Mary Cleave. She's been to space. She's been the boss of NASA's science directorate, deciding which robots go to space. And she has a great sense of humor. So long story short, I did some more research, found a way to get in touch with Mary, this not so really famous person, and we talked. And I learned more, and then I got back to reading. And then I read, and I read, and I read, and I read, and I read some more. Because the best source for making a good book is reading good books. But eventually you have to stop reading and you have to get to work. 
And the first step is building a structure using the scenes I know I want to include because the stories within them are so cool. So each scene gets a sticky note on this big, uh, big board, uh, which I can move around if I need to. And when I lay them out like this, it creates a picture. It's almost like a comics, comics page, right? Of how the book will flow from beginning to middle to end. Then I organize my note cards. I had almost a thousand for this book. So I have a pile to go with each sticky note as I turn those sticky notes into script. I'm still working alone right now since I usually don't find an assistant helpful at this stage. I sometimes don't have a choice of whether I have an assistant. I was wondering if Pepe, Pepe, Pepper might make a cameo tonight, but. <laughs> Pepper has been wandering back and forth just behind the camera. Uh, she's confused by what's going on here. I think she might even hear your voice and- Wait, <laughs> she, she's not taking a, what's it called when you take notes from? Oh, sorry. <laughs> dictation. She's not taking dictation. That's what I was looking for. She I is just not taking dictation. She has no thumbs <laughs> is the big problem with that. But anyway, sometimes Pepper is here helping. Sometimes she's not. Uh, either way, I got to write. And some days the writing starts with a conversation that I want characters to have no images attached necessarily. But I will say that every book starts with me seeing some sequence of images that'll appear somewhere in the story because that's what comics is all about. Images on the page. And that's kind of where I enter the picture. Um, pun intended because I'm drawing the pictures. But once uh, Jim's idea for the book gets to me, it looks like a fully finished strip. So every single page of the book has this kind of treatment where it has panel one, uh, Cleve talking, Cleve talking, a description for the panels, uh, kind of similar to a play or even a, a movie script. Um, and this is going to be my guidance for the book. But before I can start drawing, I've got a little bit of work to do. Jim has uh, graciously put all of the resource materials in there, and this includes books that he got information from, as well as uh, if there's photo references or videos I need to watch. Uh, Jim mentioned that NASA is very good at keeping archives. So once I got to the shuttle error part of, part of this book, I got to just like watch lots of shuttle videos, which is like my favorite. I'm like, I can't believe I actually get to do this for work. Um, just because like I could literally just watch both shuttle and International Space Station videos all day long and never get bored. So I set to work on collecting photo reference. You might have noticed that I draw very cartoony. Um, but all of the people, the places, the events that I'm drawing in my books uh, are informed by real people, places, and events. So I'm pulling photo references from either books or the internet, um, and I've kind of, this is just a fraction of them, but it's organized a little bit by era. So on the left, we've got Mercury 13, supposed to be the early, six, early 60s? early to mid 60s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Valentina Tereshkova's era, which is actually around the same time, kind of into the late late 60s. Um, and then on the right is the shuttle program, which was 70s and then Mary was the, her, was she? She's 80s. 80s, yeah. Was she 80, 85? Or is that her first? This is when, it's like the information this, just- This is why we write stuff down. So exactly. <laughs> but Regardless, um, that's about 20, 20 years of, of space history that I'm covering. Um, and a lot can happen in 20 years, both from a technological standpoint, but also from a cultural standpoint and a social standpoint. So these are all things I'm kind of thinking about even before I start drawing. But at some point, I have to start drawing, just like how at some point Jim had to start writing. And I started on the thumbnails. So this is like the first version of the book as uh, illustrated book. And what I'm doing is basic layouts, thinking about where the text is going to go, um, organizing the panels, and then just doing really rough cartoony sketches. Um, I don't want to get too detailed at this stage because there might be a couple parts that we move around or there might be some clarity issues. Uh, maybe I, like for this top panel, you know, maybe we decide that Mary wants to be on the other side of the panel. Um, there's a little bit of a rule to how we read comics. Um, when in English language. So you generally read comics um, left to right, top to bottom, if you're writing them in a language that also reads uh, left to right, top to bottom. So I'm keeping that stuff in mind so that when readers, you go to read the book, that the storytelling is clear. 
I do this to the whole book, get sent to Jim and our editor. Our editor takes a look at it. Jim takes a look at it. We see if there's any big things that need to change or little things, try and change them. If I get the green light, I get to make it more detailed and go to pencils. Um, I should mention that for the thumbnails, I was working a combination of digital and live. So I was doing some doodles on pencil on paper. Um, just sometimes it's a little easier for me to work on paper to get a gesture right, or to it just feels better to draw on paper to me. Um, but I mentioned I'm laying in the text and it's a lot easier to do that digitally and to have the pages all ready to go. Because the same page in Photoshop that I'm working on thumbs, that page will eventually end up being the final color page. There's a couple different iterations of it, but it's helpful for me to keep track of my files and sorry if this part's boring, but, <laughs> but it's, it's the reality of making a book. So I'm not just making drawings that are on paper for people to look at. There's, there's the production end of it that I wanna make sure I'm, I'm doing right. So the pencils is when I really start to look at those photo references that I've collected. Um, so for the top, it's the uh, cockpit of the space shuttle Atlantis that Mary's talking to you from. We've got our actual Mercury 13. So I use their, this, uh, this is actually photos of them from, I think it was uh, Life Magazine did a feature on them in the early, early 60s, maybe 63. And I tried to track it down and I don't think I was successful. I was like antiquing, looking for it because I was like, oh, it'd be cool to have this. Um, and yeah, if this looks good, for the whole book, do it to the whole book, um, go to inks. I do print out my pages uh, in very light blue on Bristol paper and I ink with an actual pen. Um, it's not the right or wrong way to do it. It's just the way I like to do it. It gives my eyes and my brain a break from the screen because this is a lot of looking at computers. And I just really love inking on paper. It's like very satisfying. Um, and I can, you know, if it's summertime, I can do it outside, not if it's raining, but. Um, once these are done, they get scanned, put into another PDF, the whole book, make sure it looks good. If it does, color. And it's weird to me because color is, inking and color are like the easiest parts of making a book for me. All of the stuff leading up to that is the really hard stuff. So the, by the time you get to inking and coloring, it's really fun for me personally. And coloring almost, I would say coloring probably takes the least amount of time, but I think it makes the biggest impact in terms of how we relate to a story. So it's, it's interesting, like the labor versus what it looks like. because so I think there's a pretty big difference between those two pages, just visually. Um, so yeah, and we finished the book and then there's about a year until it comes out. There's production stuff, um, shipping and all this, all these things. So sometimes when people ask me, why does it take so long for comics? Well, one, the year turnaround, uh, this book took me 18 months to draw and I didn't, I didn't write it. If I write the book, it takes a lot longer than that. Cause I, I do solo projects as well, but yeah, um, 18 months of drawing is a lot of drawing. I always tell kids, I'm like, Oh, it's like being in a grade and a half. It's like, imagine if you spent all of third grade and half of fourth grade making one book. Um, cause it's hard to wrap your head around that kind of time scale. Um, so I think I, I think I passed the mic back to Jim. Sorry if I, yeah, no, it's cool. Um, so this is, we're, we're back to looking at a script page there that Maris had already shown you. Uh, it's too small to read even when we're live and in person. But the main point here is you can see that I've written out uh, fairly detailed descriptions, especially for the first two panels of what I had in mind for Maris to draw. So the question is, once Maris has drawn a page, does it matter a ton what I wrote as far as those descriptions go. <laughs> and the answer might surprise you because, well, and actually Maris and I sort of disagree on this because I say basically, no, it does not matter what I wrote. Uh, we, and that includes our editor, look at the page as a comics page. And the story is, and if the story is clear the way Maris has drawn it, then who cares what I asked for? It's good, it's done or close to done. But I still need Jim's instructions to make the book. So uh, it, this is where we get in a little argument about it. Uh, the reader doesn't need to know that this exists because all you really see words wise is that. And then you see that, but I needed that script to make this comic. So it's a really weird uh, thing where, I mean, not really that weird, but we don't talk that much about the process of how things get made, whether it's movies or animation or right. comics or even prose novels, um, the amount of work that goes into the finished process. And that's the product. And that's why we like to talk about the process. Cause like, I remember the first time I learned about how you know, just the process of making a comic and like my mind was blown uh, just because there is a lot of 
of work. And I'm not to say, it's not to say that it's like, oh, it's so much hard work. It's just, it's really cool to see. It's like peeking behind the scenes to be like, that's what this page looked like before it looked like that. Yeah. Wow. So there's a lot of back and forth. Uh, <laughs> but basically at this point, we don't look much at the instructions part of the script unless we find a problem. Yes. And if there is one, uh, we do everything we can to fix it in the words rather than the drawings. Because as Maris just said, it takes about 18 months to draw a full book like this. So if we can fix something by tweaking the dialogue or the caption, uh, you know, I, I can type a panel a whole lot faster than Maris can redraw one. So that's kind of what we do. Now, we wanted to talk a little bit about the challenges of this book. And um, Jim and I both have, have separate responses to that question. I think for me, the biggest challenge with making uh, comics about nonfiction or comics about real events is how cartoony am I allowed to get? Um, I'm showing you two slides where one of them is super cartoony Valentina Tereshkova and the other one is real life Valentina Tereshkova or a photo of her. And I think actually this, the photo on the right was one of the references I used for that cartoon. So, and I can, it's very easy to go down the rabbit hole of like, okay, did I draw the right amount of knobs and switches and toggles on the interior cockpit of the space shuttle? Because I'm, I'm like that person wise, that's kind of how my brain likes to work. Um, but it's straddling how much I feel like I need to give you as a reader or how much we feel like we need to give you as a reader to feel like you're there maybe with the character and experiencing that, but then also to abstract a little bit because I feel like for me personally, I have an easier time relating to characters and stories when they're, they don't look exactly like real life. Um, I'm not really big into realism and that's a personal preference, but I do know that a lot of people do respond to cartoons pretty well because they are a bit of an abstraction or a simplification of what life is like. Um, and I don't mean in terms of how complicated it is, but just like how visually we portray life. So I think my biggest challenge is often figuring out A, when to stop all the research and B, um, how to straddle that realistic versus not realistic. And if you really want to see how hard I want to realist on realism, um, I was like, so that cockpit of the T-38 that Jet Mary gets to fly, that's like pretty much the act actual cockpit when I drew. I was like, yes, we're going for this. If I remember right, Mary was pretty happy about that depiction too. <laughs> it tickles me because I had so much fun drawing it. I love drawing text stuff. Yeah. And so for me, uh, the challenge is, as always, uh, what to leave out. Uh, you might remember I mentioned saying I had a thousand note cards, and you might even remember that this book came out of a scene that had to get left out, or a story that had to get left out of a previous book. Um, so yeah, I can't rely on my assistant to help me decide which facts to include in the book and which ones to set aside for a future book because there's always way more story and way more science than you can fit between two, co two covers. Um, which I guess brings us back to talking about science for a little bit. Why does this work at all? Yeah, why science and comics? Um, I, it's a good question. But you know who never asks it? The scientists and engineers themselves. They get this immediately. The only question they ever have is, why me? Well, actually, there, there's an exception to that. Stephen Hawking didn't hesitate. He was pretty sure that a, a graphic novel about him was the right idea right away. But you get the point. Every scientist you'll talk to will tell you that they communicate with pictures. Oh, while I was at Cambridge researching, the, not your Cambridge, the Cambridge over in the UK. Uh, while I was in Cambridge researching the Hawking book, I was meeting with some of his close friends and they told me that you absolutely cannot do science without drawing on a chalkboard. They were pretty hardcore about this. They said, whiteboards are no good. It's gotta be chalk. And I think that's a little extreme, uh, but you get the picture, right? Science and comics, are really a natural fit because so much of science is visual. And so much of science is about wonder. I was the flight engineer on STS 61B, so I had to be able to find our navigation stars in case we needed backup for the star tracker device. So you gotta adapt your eyes to the dark. You have a bag that you put around the window, then you look out and you find your nav stars. You know, before you really need them. 
So my first day up in orbit, I go into the little bag, hang out, and I look out. And I mean, you have never seen the stars. Even if you've been out in a dark sky, you've never seen the stars without an atmosphere in the way, messing with your view. I mean, air is not overrated, but it's, it's breathtaking. And then I think, oh, sugar, I'm never going to find the NAM stars. I'm used to seeing just a constellation or two, and now, OK, this is why we do this before a NAV computer failure. Deep breath. The colors, they're. So we use comics to tell these stories because comics make science and history accessible. Our stack of books is very tall, and we know that not everyone is a giant space geek like, like we are. Um, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> so we focus on a good character and not just a bunch of facts. And if you're with us on the first page, if you accept that this is Mary Cleave, famous astronaut, talking to you and not just a few lines on paper, well, then we've got you for the rest of the story, hopefully. It's personal. It's you and Mary having adventures together. Discovery is exciting, whether you're looking at our planet or looking out at ones we haven't visited yet. And no one is immune to that excitement. Sharing this story is sharing some of that wonder. And you'll see this over and over again in the book, and we hope you're seeing a little bit now. Scientists, astronauts, engineers, teachers, students, uh, readers, writers, and artists are all the same when it comes to feeling wonder. This has been true throughout history, since the first time people looked up at the moon and the stars and thought, huh, I wonder what that uh, giant glowing circle is and all that little twinkly dots around it. So the answers to big questions like that don't always come easy, unfortunately. Sure, that's partly because space is hard. And I should throw scare quotes around that because almost every scientist, astronaut, and engineer who's ever tried to get us there says that space is hard. But challenging stuff that everybody knows or thinks they know, that's even harder. And some of those things people think they know date back thousands of years. Ancient astronomers, like this one, once thought they were at the center of it all, with the moon and the planets and the stars all attached to crystal spheres revolving around them. It was the ultimate glass ceiling, in other words. But we know better now. And we know better because of the people who broke through that glass ceiling. The Mercury 13, Valentina Tereshkova, Carolyn Huntoon, Sally Ride, of course, and even Lieutenant Uhura from Star Trek. Yep, she's in the book, and it's for reals. And Mary, too, of course. Um, she's not a famous astronaut, but she's the perfect. Actually, I would argue at this point, we're, we're Mary, Mary's, <laughs> more people are going to know who Mary Cleave is. Because I didn't, when I started, when, I, when Jim sent me the script, I didn't know who she was, and I felt bad. Um, but despite that, she's the perfect narrator, because her story is both uh, an eyewitness to and a making of history. Through her, you'll see where we've been and where we're going and how astronauts like her and maybe like someone you know someday or maybe even you um, also make our own planet a better place. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to piggyback on the end of this real quick um, and mention that uh, if you're interested in purchasing a copy of Astronauts, uh, we recommend that you support your local bookstore and go through them. And if you came here tonight and you're interested in a signed book plate, uh, we would be happy to send you a book plate that you can stick right in your book. So this is kind of making up for the fact that we can't do a, a book signing afterwards. Uh, Harvard Bookstore would have been the local bookstore that provided books for. So if you're a local person, feel free. And even if you're not a local person, they're a great bookshop. Um, but yeah, you can email me here. Um, I'll also I'll throw this up for a little bit just so um, 
you know, and then I can maybe put a link afterwards. Um, but just let me know who to personalize it to. We'll do a drawing in there and Jim and I will sign the book plate and we'll, we'll send them to you. But honestly, thank you. Even just coming and listening to us talk uh, about this hopefully sparks a little bit of that wonder. Just like we said, you don't, you don't have to read the book. I mean, we'd like it if you did, but, <laughs> <laughs> but if this pushes you to go out and learn more about the space program or even what's going on currently in space, that's, that's awesome. And I consider it a, a job well done. There are people living there right now. I know. It's crazy. Three new, three new astronauts just arrived yesterday. Sorry, astronauts right. two cosmonauts. Yeah. <laughs> or two days ago. And, oh, sorry, I'll stop sharing, I think. Is that, or should I leave this up for a little longer? You can leave it up, Maris, unless, okay. um, yeah, you can leave it up as long as you like. And then I know you have a special surprise for us. So whenever okay. you're ready with that. Okay. So, to our audience, if you do have questions, a reminder to drop those in the Q&A box um, towards the, the bottom center of your screen on the right hand side. We do have um, a question I'd like to start with from the audience. What ways have you discovered to help you pull back from a deep research and into productivity state? How do you know if you've spent too long or not enough time in research? Oh dear. Um, well, yeah, I'm talking. Maris, do you want to go first? I mean, I've, I've got this sort of cheap, not very uh, deep and wise sounding answer. It's like, at a certain point, you see your deadline approaching like the very fastest and scariest train coming at you. And you realize if you don't start working, you'll miss your deadline for turning it into the editor. And that's a wonderful motivator. But there often comes a point to be a little bit more artistic about it. There often comes a point where you just can't wait to get to work. Um, there's always gonna be more books to read. There's always gonna be more stuff, uh, more videos to YouTube videos of uh, NASA space shuttle astronauts fooling around in zero G. Um, but you start wanting to give people your own spin on that. And, uh, even in the, even before I think I'm ready to get serious about writing a script, I'm already starting to write things down and write scenes and write chunks of dialogue and sequences of images. And you'll know when when you've read enough uh especially when stuff starts to repeat i guess and in your stack of books you, you feel like you're not getting too much out of the new thing uh so both the the itch to get going and the fear of deadline doom are excellent ways to get you to stop reading and start writing I, uh, I'll, I'll add on to Jim's because I, the book I'm working on right now is another solo project and I can blame Jim for solo projects because he's like a huge, even before we worked together, he was a huge inspiration to me from a writing standpoint. It's true. <laughs> um, he was the first person that I ever saw doing science comics and I didn't realize that that was a thing. Um, but one of the ways that I kind of avoid the rabbit hole is that when I start a project, uh, I start with a really ridiculous outline, especially for all my nonfiction projects. So I know what I want to tackle. And obviously there's that counterbalance between like, I obviously did a bunch of research even before I started the outline, but I'll have a, a scaffolding of the book so that I'll flag stuff to know that I'll need to deep dive later, but maybe I'll set aside, you know, 20 pages for, or like, that's, that's, that's a lot of pages I was going to give to Cosmic Rays, five pages for Cosmic Rays. Um, and, and tackle that later. And then because I'm a visual writer person, there's some times where I need to let myself draw because that will inform my writing. Um, so it really just depends on figuring out a workflow for yourself. But it's, it's really hard because I love research and love learning stuff. And I, like when I worked on astronauts, I was like, Jim, can you give me your recommended reading list? And it was really nice for me to get in that headspace. And I already had like, I reread a lot of my space favorites. I really love Chris Hadfield's book. Um, Oh, it's so uh, good. Yeah, just it's 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 very engaging writing. Um, and I feel like that kind of gave me a very good uh, kind of 
insight into like a more modern astronaut brain, but then I also was reading the right stuff and that like got me into like the Mercury program and like, and even just thinking about what life was like, like what if I was transported back there and I was one of those Mercury 13, like, like that type of thinking about that, those struggles um, helps. So sometimes you do just have to rip off the bandaid and start. And I say outline and um, just start writing because you can always go back. But once you start, once you start doing that, you get to a groove. Thank you. So to your point about comics helping to make science more accessible, this next question is from a five-year-old in our audience tonight. She would like to know, did you draw that picture of the stars that Mary was looking at and how did you draw it? Ah, so that is Orion, the Orion constellation. And I looked at actual photographs of that, but I did in fact draw all the stars. And I, I, I do wanna say that to get them accurately in their position, what I did was I took a photograph of it, printed it out super um, high res so I could see the little dots and I kind of traced where the dots were and then when I scanned it back down, I knew all the stars were in the right position, but then I colored it in Photoshop and I tried to color match the stars because different stars have different temperatures um, and different planets as well. You might, you might know from our friend Mars that's visible right now. Um, so I wanted to make sure that that was really real, as real as I could make it, because I still think there's something different for me illustrating stars and then instead of putting just a photo of the stars in there, I wanted it to still feel like you were in that world. Um, so yeah, I, yeah, and it was actually really fun because I love drawing little dots. It was like kind of meditative. It like made me feel pretty calm. Um, yeah, and Orion's one of my favorite constellations. So I was super excited to do that as well. Actually, that was the question I had you just answered. So Jim, do you have a favorite object in space? Oh, wow. That's tough. Um, if you have a telescope or a good pair of binoculars, it's so cliche, but point it at Saturn sometime and it'll knock your socks off if you're wearing socks and knock your sandals or your Crocs off if that's what you're wearing. It's so amazing to see that in real life. Um, but you don't always get to see Saturn. Uh, in terms of stars, I think maybe the Pleiades is great because it's it's beautiful just with the naked eye and then train a train a telescope or binoculars on it and so much more pops out it's really wonderful and i also love orion in in part because it's so recognizable and because there's so much color variation in in the stars there but also because tucked in there is a nebula. And when you, you think you're seeing just stars, but then again, when you train a telescope on it, you realize, no, it stays fuzzy when you look through it. And that's not one star, that's a gazillion of them. And that's kind of really cool. Agreed. Orion is also one of my favorites. I love the Horsehead Nebula as well. Which oh my, is yes. Tucked in there. Um, so actually, Maris, there was a question about the Chris Hatfield book that you referred to. What was the title of that? It's a gastro an astronaut's guide to life on Earth. Um, yeah. I think that's right, Jim. Does that sound right? I think right? that's right. Yep. Yeah. Um, Chris Hatfield's actually so. Um, one of the people who got me back into the kind of space stuff. I was a big space nerd as a kid, and it kind of drifted away. And I would keep up on um, current events and stuff. And I remember I was sharing the story, I think with Evan and Jim, um, that I went to uh, the, in the early 2000s, there was like a IMAX 3D International Space Station. And I went with all my friends, which was fun. But um, I started watching Chris Hadfield's uh, videos on the International Space Station after I had done a bunch of SciComm. I was working at the New England Aquarium at the time. And I, his, his uh, engagement and his enthusiasm is just electric. And I was like, oh, he's really good at SciComm. And science communication, definitely, you, there are a bunch of skills to learn to communicate science with folks, but uh, there's a lot to be said for just like unbridled enthusiasm. Um, I just, I, when it's contagious, it's great. So I, I kind of learned about him through that. Um, but yeah, and I, I feel bad. I, there's countless other people who have done really cool videos um, and I'm gonna totally draw blanks on names because I feel like my brain just goes like in the, 
All right. Who did the space? My favorite space toilet one. Is it Mike Massimo? Yeah. Uh, his is really great. Uh, there's also my niece's favorite ones. We watch a, oh, oh, and I feel awful that I'm not going to remember who she is. Um, there's basically just a like, what's it like a day in the life? And when my niece was like four or five, she was really psyched about just like brushing your teeth in space and eating in space and going to sleep in space. So it was really fun to watch them because they're so inviting and you're like, oh, this is like the astronauts getting all tucked in and the little space jammies. Um, so yeah, I, I love it. Cause there's all these places that we can't go but you can kind of go with people who are there. And that's one of the best part about these resources not just our book, but about any kind of um, and same thing for scientists, scientists too, to share their work and their discoveries with the public. It's really, really cool because it does. It takes us places we can't go. So we have another question from a young audience member, age nine. How would you compare pictures to drawings? And my, my guess is the question is more about like why the medium of drawing a comic versus telling the story with photos? Yeah, I well, did you, Jim, did you have a thought? No, go. No, we kind of, we touched on a little bit when I talked about like my decision to make a cartoony Valentina Tereshkova as opposed to make her look really realistic. Um, I find that you're kind of getting the story that we're telling you filtered through both Jim and myself. Because if you had a different artist on the book or even a different writer, it would be a very different book. It's just everybody has their own kind of personal style for how they tell stories, whether it's visually or verbally. So, um, you know, part of it is just like, I, I kind of see the world in cartoons and I like to draw my version of it and share it with other people. It's again, it's like kind of going somewhere, but, um, I, there's something about drawing things a little bit more cartoony that I just, I, that, like I said, I personally respond to stories like that. Um, but yeah, Jim, if you had a. No, you, I mean, we've talked about this before. You and I feel the same way about it. Um, and a way of thinking about it that just sort of came to me because I'm sitting right between two windows is a photo feels to me like you're looking out a window and a cartoony style feels to me like you get to open it up and stick your head through and be in the scene yourself a little bit more effectively. Uh, and there's, there are psychological reasons that this might be true. Uh, one of the famous, one of the more famous folks who writes about comics and writes about comics using comics, a guy named Scott McCloud talks about this sense, this spectrum you might have of between very realistic drawing and very cartoony drawing and what invites you in more effectively. And as you heard, Maris and I agree the more cartoony it is, the more likely you're able to see yourself in that image. Everybody can identify with a stick figure smiley face. But if Maris were to draw a super realistic drawing of Sarah, basically all you'd get to see is Sarah at that point. And for comics, we want you to see both Sarah and yourself in the story. And that's, I think, a big reason why we choose to be more cartoony. That's a really good point, actually. I did read the book last fall um, and enjoyed it very much. And, and I agree that I didn't think about that consciously, but I could see myself in the story more than if it had been more realistic uh, pictures. So thank you. This person asks, uh, what got you started in writing comics and why fact-based comics? Well, you're talking about writing, so I'm guessing you're talking to me. And here's, so I'm older than you probably. I'm just guessing, I have no idea. I can't see anybody but Sarah <laughs> Evan and Maris. But uh, back when I was just starting to think about what kind of comics I wanted to see in the world, rather than just accepting what, whatever was showing up at the bookstore, at the comic book store, um, I didn't see any comics about scientists or very many fact-based comics. And as Evan mentioned briefly, I have a scientific background 
I knew lots of stories about scientists, some of whom were seemed really cool and led very interesting lives. And I kept waiting and waiting and waiting for those comic books to show up at the store and they never did. And they still never did. And they still never did. And at some point I had this nutty idea when I looked in a mirror and said, oh, maybe it's gotta be you who tries this. And so I tried it and it worked and nobody's tried to stop me from doing it since. So they've only encouraged you. (laughs) There may be that type of story that you're looking for as a reader. Um, So maybe it's up to you to make that story real. For me, it was science comics. I don't know what, I don't know what it might be for somebody else. I don't know if you want an answer for me. I also do write my own comics sometimes. Uh, And I loved both art and science as a kid and as a young person and as an adult. And it was really hard for me to figure out how to smoosh them together uh, until I worked at a lot of museums and I saw like working in a museum and telling stories and getting people engaged with science. And I I actually went to school for art, have a bachelor's degree in illustration, which is like a pretty weird thing to graduate with because you're like, what am I going to do with this? And Turns out lots of different jobs. I learned how to bake pies and worked as an EMT and I long. It's weird. We'll talk about that another day. But um, I, I find that it's really fun to share what I'm deeply interested in with other people and comics is a way for me to do that. Um, and sometimes it's just like weird nerdy stuff. Like I love tardigrades. I think they're great and I've put them in a lot of my comics. <laughs> and it, I'm not the only one. The internet loves tardigrades. So I think it is a way to, to share information with other people and to just like get excited about science with other people. Comics allows, allows me to reach even more people than when I worked in um, a museum. Museum work is still really awesome. Um, I just, I like to draw. Yeah, and to, and to add on to that, maybe, maybe the other aspect was in, in addition to just wanting to share the stories that we were encountering, uh, to build on what Mara said, we know lots of people who are not going to pick up the super thick, all words, you know, prose biography of this scientist or that scientist. It's just too intimidating. Sometimes it's intimidating for us too, but comics, uh, as we were talking about before, just kind of invite you in. I dare you to stop in the, stop reading in the middle of a comics page. It's actually hard to do, or at least maybe that's, maybe that's just me, but I find it hard to do. Um, and that sort of compelling picture after picture thing can deliver, a, deliver certain stories to folks who otherwise just wouldn't pick up that book on whatever topic you, you might think about. I can, I can name any number of, of stories. Uh, Persepolis is my favorite example in comics. It's a story of a young woman uh, in the 1970s uh, in Iran going through the revolution there. And that's probably not a biography that, uh, autobiography that I would have read in prose, but it was comics. So I checked it out and it's amazing. And it gave, gave me, a pic, gave me um, an introduction to a world that I never would have seen otherwise. Neptune is a gas Friends. giant, right? Evan, <laughs> you want to take that one? <laughs> it, it is, Maris. Well done. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. I couldn't help, but I had to make a gas giant joke. I <laughs> Just, you know. Some serious stuff and some not serious. <laughs> we had to cut out so many scenes of the shuttle toilet and shuttle toilet training. Uh, th- this is this is a maybe a place where Maris and I would have like had to fight over what has to be included. She would have put much more toilet stuff in there. I still want to do a comic like like you need one David McCulley, the way things work, but with the space toilet because it is amazing that a toilet can operate. <laughs> Space. And there's a new one just, now. Totally yes. new. Yeah. And, and I like, I say that completely seriously because the fundamentals of like living somewhere where we're not supposed to be, right? Air, water, um, shelter, and like going to the bathroom is a huge part of that. And I- yeah, food I'm, in and food out. 
Exactly. And I, I honestly, some of the first questions that people ask me about the like big field research stuff I've done, whether it's like backcountry camping or going living in Antarctica for a while is like, so what's it like going to the bathroom? And I'm like, oh, sit down. It's going to be a while. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think that like there is that kind of human interest about basic survival um, and bathroom stuff falls into that. So I don't, I try never to dismiss that, especially with young kids. Cause like, I will talk about poop forever. Um, but I also think it's like something to not be ashamed about. And to like, again, to engineering's uh, amazingness, like it was a really big problem that they had to solve for the shuttle and the ISS. Um, yeah. And Mary was the person who yes. worked on this. Yeah. Which is like, a pretty awesome thing to be famous for. I don't know. I just like <laughs> that whole scene in the book I love because she's like, oh, this is my first job. And I'm like, but she realizes that it is like a serious job. Yeah. That's a perfect lead into the next question. So what was the most surprising fact you learned about Mary Cleave or female astronauts or astronauts in general during your research phase? Oh my. Huh. I. Or maybe a favorite fact, if there wasn't anything surprising. I mean, I, so I'll, I'll jump in to start with and say, to me, the surprising thing, and it's specific to Mary, but I don't think she's the only one, was that she wasn't all that jazzed about going to space. She just wanted to fly high performance jets. And yeah, space. That's the, that's the cherry on top of the Sunday. That's swell too. But get me, be, get me in the cockpit of a jet. That's what I really want to do. And there was no opportunity for women, uh, you know, 40, 40 odd years ago to do that other than, I mean, isn't this crazy? It's like the only way you could get in the pilot seat of a jet is to be good enough to actually be an astronaut, which is like one in a zillion people can do that. So that was the surprising thing to me because space, space has always been, would have always been my, my own goal. I feel like the, that scene with Carolyn Huntoon basically just having to demand equal <laughs> facilities. And like, I shouldn't be surprised though, because like I'm, you know, I try and learn as much as I can about history, but like that scene is pretty sobering because it's just like, yeah, they, they need showers and a bathroom and like, like, I don't know, the pushback against kind of simple things and the argument for the status quo. And I think that is, uh, I feel like something that hasn't gone away. I think that collectively we kind of agree that, okay, this is the way things are going to be. And there often is like a pushback to um, uh, change um, even if it's change for the better or change in um, power. Uh, so I think those those were, it was humbling to see that stuff and kind of similar to what we said at the end of the presentation is like where we go, where, you know, where we've been, where we're going and where we're gonna go. Um, or so where, we're, where we've been, where we are and where we're going. Um, and I feel like that's something to just kind of keep in, to keep in mind. So it was like humbling, kind of surprising, but then not that surprising. It's like a weird answer for me, sorry. That makes total sense. Um, so we had a question about your process. Now we did see the post-it notes and the cat, but <laughs> do you use a story arc or other tools to help you develop your storyline? Well, if, if you remember what that board looks like, um, it's divided into four chunks. And yes, there should be an arc to the story and some break points. This, this is the way I look at it anyway. Uh, in between those, those big sections, you know, an introductory section, a longer middle section, but with, with a little bit of peak and valley in there, and then a conclusion. Uh, as far as specific tools for that, I don't have any, none, none come to mind other than, yeah, the post-its and the note cards. It's very, you know, the way I uh, lay out, the way I plan for and uh, write out, quote unquote, write out an outline uh, is not super tech technical 
uh, it's something that could have been done uh, this way 30 years, 30 years ago. I mean, it's where the, the actual script is done, you know, on computer with, with a word processing program. But uh, that's the, hand, I mean, maybe to, to Maris's point about why she is in front of a screen for quite a while, but when it comes to the final bit, it's very hands-on with uh, manual inking uh, with, with pen and paper. Mine is just sort of flipped. All my manual stuff happens early on in the process. There's something about moving things around physically that seems to help me do an outline and to create what, what the questioner asked about, which was sort of that arc of the story. And that's why the post-its are post-its rather than glued or nailed or screwed down onto, onto a piece of wood. Uh, you got to be able to move them around because sometimes the way you thought it was going to go isn't the way it should go. That's a metaphor for life, isn't it? <laughs> well, welcome to 2020, right? Right, right. Now, you both mentioned your interest in science earlier. Do you recall what first piqued that interest? I mean, I was that kid that just like loved to watch ants and snails. Like I just, I've always been super nature focused and it was definitely encouraged by my mom. Um, in elementary school, uh, anything hands-on. I loved science experiments. I love, I mean, I also love sculpture and like, I think the hands-on aspect of both science and art are two things that drew me to it. Um, but I feel like there's formative moments. And I would say like being able to look through a telescope for the first time in grade four, uh, my, Grandma knew that I really liked science stuff and I had like astronomy books. I, I really liked field guides, um, like science books that you could get you to go outside. And my grandma was like, hey, you're, when we were staying with them in upstate New York when I was a kid, she's like, hey, your grandpa has like a telescope from World War II. You wanna, you wanna play with it? And I was like, yes. And uh, I put it on the porch at like 9 p.m. in the summer and I pointed it at the brightest thing in the sky, just assuming it would be a star. And when I looked through, it was Saturn. And I like, I like couldn't, believe it. It's, it it's it's one thing to like see illustrations of Saturn in a book and know it exists but it's another thing to like see it with your own eyes through the eyepiece of a telescope and I feel like that experience probably changed my life for the rest of my life just it didn't mean I became an astronomer but it definitely changed my relationship to the natural world and to the world around me Jim oh right um well, I, I was trying to think, and I, and I like Maris's story better than mine, so I was hoping oh. that you might not, not call on me. But since I've been called on, um, it slowly evolved through, I think, my growing realization, growing uh, comfort with doing math. Uh, and if you happen to have a facility with numbers, your teachers start to push you or help try to direct you into science. And it felt good and it felt right uh, to do that. So I wasn't necessarily the kid with the telescope or digging in the dirt all the time. I did all that stuff, uh, but I wasn't nearly as focused, I think, as Maris was uh, when I was younger. I just did all sorts of stuff. Uh, and didn't necessarily excel at any of it, but as I started to get good uh, in school, teachers, I'm grateful to them, uh, started to recognize that, hey, you're, you're all right with math and people who are all right with math tend to uh, like science things. And so maybe you should think about that too. And so you start reading books. And I can remember this one book that we get, I got from the public library that was an overview of the history of science and all I can remember is the dust jacket was kind of blue and gray, uh, and it was awesome. And that probably moved me forward more than any individual thing I read beyond, say, all the cool illustrations in, in National Geographic. Well, it's really interesting to hear that you both had a different start, really, in your interest in science, but both of you really have interest and talent in art and science and had the influence of adults in your life who supported that interest. So oh, for sure. that's really, really wonderful to hear. Yeah. Um, 
Maris, is that a self-portrait of you in the <laughs> upper left? Uh, that is. So I feel bad. I, I didn't realize that my screen wasn't being shared for the first half. That was in response for the first question, which is when do you stop researching? And I realized quickly that I had to get out of Keynote and switch to this. So yeah, I was, <laughs> I was doodling for the first half. But yeah, that's a little bit of a self-portrait. I thought you meant this one down here, which is Mars yelling, I'm in opposition. <laughs> <laughs> Mars is in opposition. No! <laughs> oh, sorry. I couldn't help it. So we have one last question, which I think is really fitting to close the evening. What was your favorite part about working on astronauts? And I'm going to stop sharing. Is that okay? I'll, I'll Sure. Because I feel like I need to like, focus for this one. <laughs> um, Jim, I don't know. Do you want me to go first? Either way. I mean, I, mean, I, know, I know my answer. <laughs> I, getting to work with Jim again, I feel like this is, <laughs> I, after finishing primates. That was my answer. Ah, no, that's perfect. <laughs> Wait, getting to work with yourself again? <laughs> no, um, I, as soon as I finished primates, I really wanted to work with Jim again on a project and I didn't know it was the first primates was the first book I ever did professionally and I was incredibly grateful but I was like oh my gosh this is so much fun he's just really fun to collaborate with the scripts that Jim writes like the way that he tells stories in comics is so different from how I personally write comics so it's such a breath of fresh air to adapt or to collaborate on his scripts and bring them to life so when he told me about just the concept for astronauts, I was like, oh my gosh, I love space, but I would never know, I would never know where to begin to make a book about space. That's not something I would choose, but to have someone who is so awesome at writing books be like, do you want to illustrate this one? I'm like, yes. So it just, I don't know. I learned a bunch of new stuff and that was the, that was the, the best part. It was like getting to, getting to work with Jim again. Well, thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, very similar answer. In fact, identical in spots, um, including all the learning stuff. But for me, the, the biggest joy is, so I've written this script. I've spent a long time thinking about this story. I have, a, I have it in my head and now it's on the page uh, as a script. And then you wait a little bit and then you wait. And it's like getting this coolest present ever a story that is your favorite thing and all of a sudden it's illustrated by a favorite artist and so seeing the seeing it come to life on the page as comics uh through maris's drawing that's that's like the favorite moment it's like it's real it's it's gonna be a real comic book and that's I don't think that's ever going to get old. If people were looking for one specific page, the splash page where I got to show the shuttle taking off, I like cried. I love, I was like, so I'm like, I get to draw the shuttle and it's blasting off. And like there, there were moments in the book where like I got to illustrate really important moments in history, not just to us, but like to myself. Um, so sorry. I know if, I was like worried. Someone's like, that's not the answer I wanted. You said each yeah. other. <laughs> if, if, <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, if we're looking for a particular page, I guess my favorite one is one I really don't want to spoil. Uh, it's, there's a scene where NASA engineers have a very wrong idea of what should go in a personal preference kit for... That scene is also really funny. The, for uh, some, some of the astronauts who are about to go up, on the, go up into space. And what happens then is just hilarious and awful at the same time. And Maris really nailed it. Thank you. It was really fun getting to cartoon Sally Ride and Kathy Sullivan in that scene. Cause I was just like, oh my gosh, this is. <sighs> ah. Well, thank you both for joining us tonight. Thank you for giving us a sneak peek into your collaborative process and showing us a bit about your book. So thank you so much, Jim, Maris, oh, and Evan. Thank you to Jiro Studios and my colleagues, Mary Claire and Catherine. And thank you all for joining us this evening in the audience. This will be the final Fall Observatory Night, but we look forward to seeing you in the spring with more details to come.
Good night, everyone. Thank you Good so night. much. Good night. Thank you, everybody.